previous tape we got some flights recorded and we feel like it's just about as at this point in time is as successful as anything we could have ever dreamed of or expected it's certainly much friendlier right off the bat than Miss Ashley was much friendlier than some of the Cardinals in the shop have been it's been the one word that describes it best is friendly so far it's really been a joy to be out flying and it hasn't given me any any headaches at all so far but one of the things we have a couple other little projects around the shop that I want to work on and I have some really exciting pictures from Ken Clapson showing his pond racer in silver so we want to get those on the video first problem is we're already dreaming about our upcoming B-25 project. I just can't believe this. I've, I've got a half a gallon of fuel through this and I'm already dreaming about next year's plane. It shows that I do have mental illness. Because I guess with model, any modeling endeavor, you're never really finished. It's a journey. It's not a destination. And this is just a watershed on our trip to somewhere, and we don't know where that somewhere is yet. And if we did, it wouldn't be much of an adventure. And we sure are dreaming lately, I'll tell you. I've been looking at plastic models, trying to gather some pictures down at our local library. They didn't have anything B-25 related, though, so I've ordered some stuff. We're going to see if we're going to get it this week. And this is Ken's... I don't know the best word for it. The, the Pond Racer replica, I guess, is the right word. Two Sato 30s, which is the same power we anticipate using in the B-25. So we hope that uh, Ken learns and gets this all dialed in for us. And I hope, Ken, you're going to be reporting in to us. One of the things we know is the Sato 30s are about 9 ounces. So that would be a total weight of 18 ounces for two motors basically the same as a 90. Now I just can't wait to see. See, I hope Ken is going to get some video for us. Now see, one of the problems that we've really, well, we'll see how Ken's worked out, is connecting all these flaps, because on a B25, there would actually be four flaps, and they have a, an anhedral, dihedral break, so there's going to be, we're going to try to get this week, in fact, we're going to try to get some of those flex joints, their aerospace quality. We're going to try to use them, of course. I don't know how Ken did this with multiple push rods or what, but we'll see how this all worked out. Some pretty sexy looking cowlings there. I know he molded these out of composite, too. Well, 
looks like quite a project sanding off all this silver. And it's basically a modified cardinal kit. It's a woman like now and then could It's always the case if you don't take a chance on failing, in essence what you do is you win the battle and lose the war. And that's what we're going to be doing with our B-25 project. We're going to take a chance and roll the dice and hope we can come up with something really unbelievable. And if we can't, well, that's the price of trying to push the envelope. And it looks like that's exactly what Ken has done here. Also anticipated possibly building a Valkyrie, and we're going to send him up a set of the Valkyrie to Harold Price plans. He also did this this tech sheet that goes with the pictures. I don't know if Stunt News is going to print this, but we'll find out. We look forward to seeing this painted. Ken, this is a project. I am impressed, and we are going to be following in your footsteps. Now, one of the little projects that I wanted to make, and because we have an unflyable rainy day here, I guess I'll lay this out. I went and bought a piece of this is quarter-inch uh, furniture. I guess they, I guess it's walnut or something. I don't even know. They say they call it furniture wood in Home Depot. It's about six dollars a sheet. It's quarter-inch. But one of the things I wanted to make. See, this is inconvenient to me is to have to carry the battery like this and the starter. And this starter, by the way, is a hundred times better than that other little, the little yellow thing. I don't know the one that uh, Sullivan makes. This one really has the power. So one of the things I wanted to do, I want to make a little tote bag, and then a little, like a little tote box, so that when you, assuming you're not going to make any trim changes to the plane, you can just take the box that will have the starter, the battery, the lines, and a gallon of fuel. Just so that walks up to the con to the line with you, and, and it has no spare parts, no wrenches, tools, whatever. It'd be as small and light as possible, and maybe even make accommodation. I could slide the stooge in on the end or something like that. The idea of this is, and it's it's really cumbersome to be carrying a big toolbox all the way to the line. You open it up, and all you do is take the battery and the lines out. Well, I always wanted to make one of these, and because we're in a period of rainy weather, I'll have plenty of time to cut out the parts. So what I want to do, the first thing is, I, you see, I laid this out with a with a pen. Is just lay out how much space I actually need for this. I need to get a line reel and possibly the stooge and start cutting out some pieces of wood. Now because I cut this with a jigsaw, I don't really get my exact for the edge. What I do is I take the, the tri-square and just get a, a line on there and do the last little bit of the edge. If you happen to have a thousand dollar table, you know what you're going to do. You can't believe it. I'm not making this up. Here I am editing video down, looking at it. Here comes the real pond racer around. Ken, eat your heart out. Wow. It just shows you never know. And this is what's nice about looking at videos constantly. You never know uh, what you're going to see. You, you watch a video, you think you've seen it all, but you really haven't. There's the real pond racer right there. Clapsing, eat your heart out, Shady. Anyway, to go back to our project here as we take our coffee break, Karen picked this up at a garage sale. Well, she paid three dollars for it. I think she got them down to two. But it's the thing I wanted it with it. It has a handle. Now, it looks like it's pretty well chewed up. I was thinking if I could use this handle, i got to see if I can get that off. This would make a nice comfortable handle for carrying a toolbox with it. If I can't use it, I'll make one out of wood. But anytime you can use garage sale stuff, of course, the advantage of having it, you know, of course, you could use the suitcase too. If you can get a handle like it, it really is comfortable, and it really is annoying having these, uh, I don't know, I've, I've had them, that one that's on my toolbox is terrible. It bites into your hand at the end of the day. We have a toll in the I don't I guess when you get a $3 suitcase, you don't get the pick, though, you know.
Allen. And then learn it. Add this to the really engine as well. Now, I don't know if there's something holding that on there. Well, I guess they're smart. They notice this is going to take a beating. And they'll just keep cutting that away till we get that handle off. But anyway, that's a source. If you go to garage, that's a source. A good part could make a control handle out of that. <laughs> would be nice. That is, this would even be nice on the toolbox I have now. I ought to get another one at a garage sale and use it. And it's padded and it's nice. Now I have to figure out how I want to adapt this to my to my toolbox. This is the only thing that's a little ripped. I hope put a little CA on that. I think this is going to be great. Accomplished in the first session here. I need to get some rings or make some something to attach that. The gallon jug fits on one side and along with a line reel. Remember this is not a toolbox, this is just a let's go to the line. And I need to make some edges when I come back from work. Luckily we're not wasting a rainy day doing this rental property work. I'm just glad it's get it done on a rainy day. Anyway, when I come back, this is going to be the base, and then I'll have to buy some, obviously I have to buy some hardware, but these are the things, I've always wanted to have this little thing that you just take to the line, fuel the plane, put the battery, and take it away. And this will serve not as a toolbox, but as a uh, go to the line box. With the four strokes, and you know, I like to use the electric starter, it's uh, just very convenient. Just like I don't like to go out to my car and hand crank it. When I go for a ride on my motorcycle, I don't like to kick it. I even have an electric start snowblower. I wonder if people know that. Anyway, we'll be back later and we'll work on that toolbox. Today's lesson, never buy a two-family house. Anyway, I want to cut the rest of these. I'm back. What? You couldn't imagine what I have to put on. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to use all tools that I already, you know, if you have a table saw, your Yankee workshop and a router and this and that. Well, basically, these are all tools we use to build models. So what I'm doing, I'm just tacking this together with CA. What? Tack it together with thick CA and then fill a joint with thin CA. Of course, you could use aliphatic. But this is just material I just happen to have right in the shop here. And one of the things, really, I want to keep the weight to a minimum here because I want to be carrying this thing all over the planet, especially at the Nats or at the team trails. Now, once the parts are tacked in, I'm trying to get a V to thin CA in there, too. came up with a way I think I'm going to be able to attach the handle with key ring chains, two key ring chains. One will go this way, so that will give me a nice handy way of handling that. Now what I want to do is put one side on, I cut an extra piece of wood, I want to get one side on, and then I want to lay out my little ribs inside for holding a jug and holding a starter and things in place. We'll get the whole thing out of one, one half sheet of this plywood. Like I said, it's relatively cheap. The trick that I've found is that there's there's two distinct sides to this. There's a finished side, this is made for cabinet work, I guess, and an unfinished side. And of course, keep the unfinished side inside. And in this case, I'm actually using the part itself, and use all 90 degree angles. And even if you're not a furniture maker, I mean, it doesn't, this is, there's nothing here that's really difficult to do, and you probably can do it in one or two little quick sessions. What I try to do is use a a 90 degree triangle to do to line this up. Once I have it lined, tack it in place. Check that I didn't lose the 90 degrees. I'm going to make a permanent blue seam. On this side, I wanted to make room for a gallon jug or a can, and they both fit. 
and a line reel, or maybe two line reels, a spare handle, something in there. This side, I want to make a little wall around the battery so that stays in place. And then when I'm done, start the engine, we put this in here, take the flight box off the line. Again, nice little quick project. Got this little box, which is just the right size for the battery. The starter fits in there, which would be very convenient. And I need to figure out exactly what else I want to put in here. Now, I'm not sure what, I, what else I want. I need to have the little uh, NICAD, so I need to get a little a little space to put that. It was to make a thing, and I took all my tools to see what I really am going to need. I'd like to have two batteries. So once the motor starts, I can take the battery off. I don't go rolling it across the parking lot into the prop or losing it or whatever. Nothing could stop me from losing things. That was the next little thing. It looks like everything I need to fit a jar of alcohol in here, and I'm pretty well closing in on what I want to have. That pretty much gives me everything I want. I always take sunscreen. I'm real conscious of not getting sunburned. A lot of skin cancer in the family, and I don't want to add my name to the list. Jar of alcohol for wiping the solid lines. Place for the gallon can or jug. Lines to starter. Battery, an extra battery. And possibly in the bottom of this box, once it's finished, uh, room for some, uh, some other little incidentals. See, I just don't know. This thing grows and grows and grows. It's to the point where I can't even pick it up anymore. But this will stay the real toolbox. What I want is a box to just, when I go flying, I'm not going to do any maintenance on a plane. I'm going to fuel it, start it, and be done with it. I guess I should figure out a way of putting some paper towels in here, too. Although that's not a real important thing right now. What I decided to do is leave the stooge and the paper towels as a separate thing. Because I, don't, I, I usually took one paper towel, and this the Typhoon doesn't get a lot of oil on it with the down-facing muffler. This little tip that I found for these alcohol, we use only 91% isopropyl alcohol. You can see you can buy it in Rite Aid. It's about a dollar a jar. But I have this. This is the top that belongs on a... Uh, one of these designer water bottles, and it seems like that just works perfectly as opposed to unscrewing the cap every time you use it. So that's worked out well. That's a nice little tip. So what's going to happen? This is going to stay our main toolbox. This will stay in the truck, but when we go to go flying, we'll just have to pick this up. And the other nice thing is everything fits the battery off, take the starter, and one guy, even at a contest, can just take the tool. Everything stays self-contained. You don't have things rolling under the prop, under, over, losing a battery. Where's the battery? Where's my... Everything should stay in one thing here. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is a really thorough sanding. I'm really going to take this outside and sand it down real nice, because I'd like to get a nice finish on it, of course. concerns with this is that it's going to get fuel soaked and oil soaked. So what I'm going to do is all the edges and joints I'm soaking with, this is old CA at Mike left here. And I really don't think this is, this would make good glue, but it's really quite old. But we can use it up for a, a process like this of sealing all the end grains. Now the main thing with it, when it comes to the finish of this is I want to have a fuel proof finish. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to mix up epoxy resin. I want to seal all the ends with hot stuff first. Now West Systems resin is what they use to coat boats. They use to coat wood boats, so I think it'll make a nice, uh, well, we're going to find out if it makes sense. We're going to find out a lot here. But the first thing is always to seal up all these end grains are a problem. Because once oil gets in there, even the bottom ones, and I'm going to get some little hardware, some feet and corners and little things for this. But all these edges, this is all end grain. And then after this is done, I'll give it a sanding with some 400, some fine paper. It's already been roughed out on adult sander. This will go a long way. Now, I want longevity. Once you get something that you really like, you hate to have to make another one. By the way, this is a nice project. If you have a modeling friend and you're looking to, uh, you know, make him a, uh, a little gift maybe for Christmas or his birthday or something, you can make this. We pretty much made this in one day. Finish it'll probably be another day. By the weekend, we'll be using this. 
putting one of these, these end grains on top, but this is where it's going to really take a beating. I'm kind of rough on equipment, especially toolboxes. And Mike is even rougher than I am. And when he takes the toolbox to the field, he uses it for a football, a baseball. Not sure if he does that on purpose. The trick is don't use any kicker. Wipe it with a paper towel. That gives a nice slow kick to it. This part up here, all the end grain in here will probably take a beating from putting batteries in and out. Last thing on this, before I actually put the epoxy down, I want to get a nice smooth finish, especially on the outside, get rid of all the corners and edges. these edges on the inside I'll do by hand but I don't need to be that fancy about it. I want to have these nice and smooth though. Now I'm mixing up some resin. This is West Systems 105 and 206. It bonds to wood exceptionally well and what I'm going to do is just pour some down in the bottom. This is to seal the inside up. We can pour this right in. Because what happens if it's in a big mass, see the problem is if you mix three ounces in a cup like this and it's in a big mass, it'll go off in a matter of seconds. Well, it's out of seconds, but now while it's in there, let's see if we can put this on. Because this is really the way to fuel proof something. The resin's relatively inexpensive. If it's a nice day like this, you put it out in the sun. And in an hour or so, this will be ready to sand. And I might need two or three coats, I'm not sure. But it'll certainly seal it and keep it fuel. Especially the inside. And the outside doesn't need to really be as fuel proof as the inside. But the inside had better be fuel proof. This is actually what West Systems resin was designed for, to be used on wood boats where they were laminating fiberglass onto wood boats. That was the original invention. And as you get drips and drools, just work them out and work them up the side. We can work some up here. Now, while it's kicking off, and you really have a limited amount of time with West Resin, you're just trying to get all the brush strokes out, any brush hairs. This, of course, will strengthen it a lot. It'll make it totally fuel-proof. And, of course, it looks real nice. So there you have it. It's a real nice, simple project to work on. Something I think anybody's, anybody reasonably has a reasonable chance of getting this to come out real nice.
That will make our days at the field a little bit, uh, since we're always lugging everything around. Just got to watch I'm not picking up schmutz here as this is in the sun. Fiberglass is drying up. And I thought I'd try to. You can see the breeze on the flags is already starting to come up. It comes up at 6 o'clock in the morning at this field. It's unbelievable. The sun isn't even up yet. But I need to get a couple of flights because I have some work to do in the real world and unfortunately do not have the whole day to spend down here. But just the point I make is when you really do want to get some flights, a lot of times you just have to get up early in the morning. Well, what I've come to the conclusion, a couple of things, is the last couple of days that I've been flying, that this the Sato 91 definitely needs to run. That's the pressure is. I've totally abandoned the idea. I've run it with pressure, without pressure. It's always better with pressure. I've tried all three of the 14.5 props that I painted up. They were all pretty much ballpark, and they're what we're going to use today for our test flying. We're going to try to get a couple of flights. I have a spare handle, and I want to make up a spare set of lines. So I'll have a couple little jobs to do while the motor's cooling down. And basically what I want to do is videotape a couple of the flights so that I can go home this afternoon, put them up on the screen, and get a look at what I have here. I'm, I'm real satisfied so far. It seems like there's very little to do, but again, nothing beats having it on video. You can go back, look at it, play it over again, and if nothing else, just have it for background noise instead of listening to the, uh, the redundant noises in the shop. You can see we're already using solid lines. We've gotten rid of the test lines. So far it's been, it's just as good as it gets. Now, the biggest thing to come up with here was, at least in my case, step down. the biggest thing was to come up with, when I'm, when I'm flying alone like this, to come up with a stooge management system. So I really get afraid this thing pulls so hard, I'm just, I get skeptical it's going to pull a stooge out of the ground or whatever. I get a little nervous. Well, we have 20 days left at this field. We have two contests coming up that will both be on this field. One is this weekend. And this, having use of this field has just been a godsend in terms of the air is different. It's a lot more like Matt's air. I'm totally impressed with how this 91 just, you run it rich, you run it lean. Big crop, up pitch down. It just seems to want to lumber along it. What I think is just a nice power setting. It's about two-thirds throttle. I'm just going to guess between three-quarter and two-thirds. I have it marked on the servo. You definitely do not want to start. Don't even think about a full throttle first. Talk about something that could ruin your whole day. Anyway, the routine has been four bumps backwards. Usually it bumps cold, hot, doesn't matter. As long as you get a little bit of fuel in the car, right? When you push it backwards, it pushes the extra fuel out the exhaust valve so you don't get a flood. And usually the start is kind of routine.
is. When, when you shoot video, you can shoot it for a, for a lot of purposes. The first purpose would be to look at geometry, shape, sizes. We're not at the point where we're trying to fly precision stunt patterns and and you know fiddle for is this straight or intersections or anything. What we're trying to do is accomplish something that everybody that has a, a brand new plane and possibly a new motor combination is going to be faced with. And I thought, these are the things I can learn from this camera angle. I tried to make notes that I thought would be, he would be helpful. First off, the thing I can do right away is I can see the motor settings. I can hear that I'm just a bit on the rich side, and that's where this, where four cycles like to be, is just a tad on the rich side. In other words, if they're, if they're too lean here, and too rich here, they want to be maybe just a, ha a, pa a hair past halfway. I found that to be a significant thing when setting up a four cycle. What happens if you run it all the way toward the lean side, you, get, you basically don't get any benefit from the motor. It'll not change speeds at all. Now I'm not talking about a 2-4 run. What I am talking about, and you can hear it on that video, you really can't hear it like you can in real life. It, I call it a vertical lean out. What happens in a vertical maneuver like a vertical 8 is right here the motor will pick up speed. It's going to run leaner because of gravity. And right about here, not like a 2-4. You don't hear a dramatic change in sound because the motor is much quieter and you don't hear it. But it certainly happens. Now what happens is when you're on the lean side of the motor setting, coming downhill, it accelerates. So if you see you're accelerating on the downhill sides of maneuvers, it probably means you're running the motor too lean. And you need to back out a few clicks. Now, the 91 has about a half a needle valve turn. I can go from basically from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock. So what I do is I find my too lean setting, where it starts to lose RPM, back out a quarter of a turn, and I know I'm going to be real close. I know I'm going to be a click in or a click out. And that works every time under every condition. There's never a time you have to put up with a lean or a rich run. A couple of the other things that, that I think are just, as far as this plane goes, first off, the motor ran right from the get-go. We never had any trouble with some of the incipient things that you can have from time to time. It was broken in properly, run in properly. It's got the right prop load, almost the right prop load, I should say. But a couple of the things that I've noticed. Now, the 72 does this. And so does the, the 91. And that is, and it's a really nice thing, right about at the vertical 8, it'll start to run a little bit faster. And it gives me a little bit of an accelerator, and you can actually hear it. If you make the TV real loud, which is what I've been doing here, when I've, that's why I shot from that angle. I want it to be right under the muffler as close as possible. But at the end, the two worst maneuvers that I've found, are, and, and you can have a beautiful, perfect stunt pattern, especially when the wind is blowing and you go up for the overhead eight and the thing, you start crawling on your knees and getting on a creepy crawler and yeah, this seems to right about that point in time kick in like, like it just goes leaner. And I'm sure because of the way Joe has the tank set up with the baffling and he'll, he can probably, um, you know, duplicate that in any tank he makes for us. But it's the end of the, I call it the end of the tank lean out. The other thing is I want to shoot for having 6 minutes to 6.15. The reason is, if we fly this plane at the team trials, we can't have the luxury of having that extra minute. So there's no point right now, we're not using a throttle yet, I'm not comfortable enough with the plane, and there's still significant things I want to do. And to me, the throttle is like an afterthought. That's going to work every time. It's not going to be, ever be that it just doesn't work, because if it doesn't, I'll take the one out of the red plane. And I'm having Sergio make me up another transmitter. But I do have, and this is what the plane being brand new, what, what seemed to work, all of these things seem to work right off the bat. And I think this is a thing that I can duplicate relatively easily now. Anybody that's using a 91, we, we can make it run just like this one instantly. We have this amount of information in the bank. And I think the biggest single thing is the break-in has to be a full hour. Full hour and not not a fast break-in, under 4,000, just like the manufacturer recommends. Once, of course, it's broken in, you have a half a gallon through what amounts to be, a call them safe flights. The plane still has a little bit more than it needs tip weight. We started out on braided lines just to see if the, the switch from braided 
to solid was going to be dramatic, and it was. It, it flies better on solid lines. There's no question in my mind. So always the, tr the, the hinge lines are always taped. And we, tr we trimmed it out on two different scales at right at 66 ounces with all the, the batteries, the servo, the, the electric eye, all of the electronics are in there. And the heavy spinner and the heavy gear. Now we have lighter spinners, but, but I want to have a trim schedule. And, and Paul Walker wrote that excellent thing that's in one of the flying models things. I think it's on his impact article. But, but I have something that's not a, not a whole lot different. But the first thing is to get, get used to the motor. This is the part that most people skip. Now, Jose Modesto is another one that's going to be starting a four-cycle program. And you've got to get used to the certain routines and the, the little things that go along with four-cycles. And the first thing is, I would say, put a half a gallon through and just fly safe flights. And we've basically done that already. That's, that's in the bank now at the field because our lines were about six inches too long that first day we were flying. And we were using another plane's lines, and this plane has longer a wire coming out of a ring by about six inches. But but I want to trim this plane from this point on, I want to have full length solids. I don't even want to consider going to 68 foot lines or all of the things that mask over trim problems. I want the trim problems to surface, and they will surface as soon as you put the plane on full length and with it's on it already. Before I do any real trimming on a plane, I want to get dead consistent motor runs that every one is a six to six fifteen. Every one is a click in or a click out, never more than a click in or a click out, and I think we've already got that part of it. Then comes the big one, setting a handle. Now we've we've flown, we have two handles that we've flown with already. One's on the braided lines, one's on the solid lines. But a handle is the most significant trim thing in the whole plane. Now the choices are line spacing, and of course we adjust for if the plane turns unequally. What a lot of people don't understand is there's no such thing as a plane that turns equally. Because of the height of the tail, the relationship of the elevators to the stab, the vertical CG, there's so many variables that it would be a miracle if a plane turned dead equal. This one turns real close to equal. It seems to turn just a tad tighter inside than outside. And the way I adjust for that is one notch in or out on the handle. But what really is significant, and this plane, I haven't even gone and tried a long arm handle. I don't think I'm even going to have to because the first handle I put on there with the short arms, it had that real light power steering stick load that I like, and I was real comfortable. I tried several different positions just to see. Now, the way I would establish this, if we're in the middle position here, and the plane is turning tighter one way than the other, the, the way that it's soft turning, I'd go up one notch. If it was turning soft inside, go up one notch. But it's very obvious when you've gone too far. You pull out of a corner and the plane either goes up on an angle or you do one of these wiggle wobble deals. When the handle is right, the plane is going to come out 99% of the time and just stop. Now, we hope in the next few days we're going to fine tune the handle. That's the next big project that we have is to try the two handles that we have a couple of settings further down to, to the downside until it overturns and then back off a couple of sides on the inside and then back off this is just a whole day of flying time consuming stuff but once this is right every time you pull out it'll be real close to being perfect the long arm handles typically I would say this they are for 35 ships Nobler's Thunderbirds smoothies Short arm handles, any plane bigger than a 35 ship. And that's just a rough general rule. Now the next step in flying and fooling around is we, we have ordered all these props. We don't have any of them yet. So we're going to work on a toolbox this afternoon. We'll try to finalize up that toolbox. But what we found out, a 14.5 rev up. Let, let's make a little chart here. For a 72, a 14.5 rev up. And by the way, Findlay Hobbies has them in stock right now. Anybody wants to run over and grab a hundred of them. Here's, here's the big thing. A full-size prop on a cool day is about perfect. On a really hot day, 80, 90 degrees, you want it to be about 13 inches cut down. But if you cut it to 13 and a half diameter, what happens? It works real good on a cool day. It doesn't, it doesn't over-accelerate. And it seems to have enough blade area to pull even tradition on a hot day. So my feeling is you can kind of save yourself a lot of testing. Pull Finley's hobby up. 
make yourself up a set, maybe a 14, a 13 and a half, and a 13, and I think if you have a 72, you're in the bank. Now, the 91, since we're the only one on the planet that's using one, we don't, we don't know what prop to use, but I thought a good place would be, since this is on the, the high end, but the 14.5 doesn't really load the motor enough. You have to run it rich. The things you have to do is close the throttle more than I want to close it, and also run it on a rich side. So what I'm looking for, and I've ordered these, is there's no such thing as a 15.5 prop. I could not find one anywhere. I call Tower, I call Finley's. I even contacted a fellow in England that hand makes props that I'll know by the end of the week if he's going to be able to make me some. I also, I also had Lyle Larson contact APC to see if he'd custom make me some props, some molded props. And that may or may not happen in the next week or so. But if he does, what I'm looking for is a 15 inch diameter with about a 4.5 pitch. Now I don't have that yet, but when it comes time to test props, that's one of the final key things. I also ordered some big three blades, some 14 inch three blades. I ordered some big uh, top flights. So we're gonna have a nice, a nice maybe next week, a, a couple of days of testing different props. But I really think what we're gonna be able to do, we're gonna ultimately wind up somewhere in the 15 inch range. Now what's nice about that is that you have tremendous, tremendous drive through wind and rough air and everything. It, it's, a, it's an eerie feeling to have that much power on tap. And the only thing I can relate it to is the first time you've ever driven a car that has a Chrysler Hemi in it, or when we were kids, a, a car that had a 500 horsepower engine. You just touch the gas and things happen quickly. And the problem with our plane is that it, it kind of happens too quickly. When that thing is sitting in the stooge and you release it, it goes from here to the first third of the circle like, it's, like it got launched by a catapult. So I don't know. This is going to require a lot of testing, but it's going to be interesting. I'm going to try to share it all on video. I realize most people are going to be, in fact, the motors I've been selling, I've sold more 72s than anything else, and it looks like that's going to be the engine of choice for most people. But I still want to develop the 91, and I hope eventually we're going to have, maybe at some point in time, we'll be able to retrofit with the 72. Now that's about two ounces lighter. But if I have to put the 72 in and add two ounces of nose weight, I may as well leave the 91 in there. Anyway, it's it's been a surprise to me how friendly the motor's been. I've been totally impressed. And I tried to get some shots. Now you'll see, I want to put one more flight on this video. And then we're going to go back to work. But what I did, I was flying, and somewhere in the middle of the flight, a bird flew into the circle. I almost whacked him. And I mean, from inside the circle, it looked like I, look, I might have even got his tail. But I know I didn't. I didn't see any feathers around the circle. Anyway, and Peeps doesn't think that's funny, by the way. Let me put that flight up here, and then we're going to get back to work on the toolbox. Now, this is a geometry flight. I'm trying to look for geometry, but the air was moving around. It really got, uh, you, you can see the wind shifting and moving. So at some point, when it gets like that, I just bail out, go have a cup of coffee, and get back to the shop. I shot that. It looked like it was going to run out of gas, too. I got a little nervous. I'm still not, you know, I don't have enough time on it to know exactly what the mileage is at every needle setting. And while I'm doing these props, going through the set of props, I don't want to take any chances there. But I try to get the camera downwind for a flight now. And then I'll have something to look at when I get back to the shop. Okay, flight three. Coming up.
You see that bird? We had to end this session with a, if you see that last flight, a near miss of a bird there somewhere in the flight. Probably have to play that back on slow mo this afternoon. Anyway, productive day. Motor has been pretty consistent. And we're looking forward to getting those props, maybe today in the mail, and getting them worked. That'll be our next thing, is to develop more than one prop. Now, we did have a chance this morning to fly in some really dead air, and you can see we've been moving around. It's been shifting and moving, and you got thermals coming up off the parking lot here, of course. And it seems to handle those conditions relatively well, so we're going to quit while we're ahead. We'll get a cup of coffee and get back to the shop. Now, after I reviewed this footage, one of the things I learned, it was one of the things I had put on here previously, is it still has a tendency. It, it seems like the handle setting on insides is about where I'd like it, especially the triangles seem to be almost automatic. It's a relatively difficult maneuver, but I still have a tendency, if you look at the tail of the plane, as it comes around, it'll do that. And usually the cure for that is a real simple cure. If this is the handle, you don't really, you, first off, you can put nose weight in the plane. We're not going to put nose weight in the plane. But on the downside, I think we have five or six choices, is to move one notch up. And you'd be amazed, even one, one setting up with the cable, usually what will happen, if it doesn't get rid of it, then go two. But it'll flatten out the turns. And what I really like about this plane is it seems to come down out of a corner and lock in real nice. I don't have any of this wiggling only on those outside. And I've been playing with this, by the way, in between flights. But, but see, from having it on video, now I know I can even adjust it even more. And when we start doing geometry flights, I'll have to start working on that wing over being straight. It's leaned over. All my old habits are back because I haven't been flying all winter. I need to also, I think from the, I thought we'd get it better from the other camera angle. You can hear the motor kick in on the verticals and on the hourglass. And toward the end of the flight, when you're really you're desperate for some little extra power, it is so nice to go into the overhead eight knowing it's going to kick into overdrive. Anyway, we got work to do here. The first thing I want to do is work on this toolbox because I want to get a routine. This toolbox is going to be a key part of working with this plane. I need to develop a routine, a start routine. I basically fly all summer by myself, and I need to have everything on a very, very regimented basis. And having that little toolbox that I'm making is an excellent little accessory. From the flying field, I stopped and got some hardware. And I actually think having this little box is, is a major improvement over the way you st I even tape some of the starting routines. What's the reason? I come home, I look at them, I say, gee, that looks clumsy, that looks clumsy. That looks clumsy. And yeah. I only have so much energy. I'll be honest, though. Anybody that's 55 knows you only have so much energy. And if you waste it doing things you don't need to do at the flying field, you get less flights. So this, I think this toolbox is going to work in my favor some, anyway. Anyway, the epoxy dried, and it's, I'm not worried about the bottom. I have a little feet for it. It's got a nice, relatively nice finish on it. Even more than being a nice finish, the purpose of it is it's durable. It's something I'll be able to kick around. First, I wanted to knock down some of the sharp edges with this. to make it as smooth as possible, not for cosmetic reasons, just so it's it's nice to, when you rub up on your leg or something, you don't cut yourself or, you know, I don't want any sharp edges on that. Yeah, we even got the last coat of clear on Mike's PM. Mike's going to be over here later, I don't know, today or tomorrow, when he can, to pick it up. And one of the things I wanted to show, this is the first plane we've painted with our new fan system, which... If you look up in the, when Mike put the roof on the garage, he put this large air moving fan. And we've done, we've done virtually all the painting in here. The only problem is you have to take all the vehicles out of the garage. Otherwise you get paint dust on everything. But I think this, 
this is going to buff out to be one beautiful aeroplane. And I would highly suggest anybody, what I learned from this whole project, don't use acrylic. Go with all Brodac, and you'll save a lot of work. It'll be a lot less work in the long run. And we'll see the next time we see this plane, Mike will have it all buffed out. This is our old standby <laughs> while we're waiting for the finish on our little tote box to dry. And finally, from Tower Hobbies, this is the first set of props that I ordered came in. And these are, this is a 15.6, a PowerPoint. Of course, it's got more pitch. If you look at it this way, you can see the difference in pitch. Quite significant, in fact. The thickness at the hub significant. I also, because I don't, I'm walking into uncharted water, and I don't know if six is going to be a. I bought a, a 15.8 also. Now that's a little thicker, and I can possibly uh, depitch, or if I'm using, once I have the throttle operational, this will be fine, by the way, because I can just throttle back. But right now, really can't do that. I also bought a master air screw. This is a 15.8, and the only reason I bought this is I wanted to see how heavy these props were. And believe me, this pro I'm going to weigh all these. This one is a ton. And I also got what may wind up being one of the props of choice. It's a three-blade 14.7. And they give you some nice information on the back as far as what engine. And I'm trying to see what they're suggesting a 14.7 would be. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, we don't know. You know, this is all RC information. Anyway. This looks like, if nothing else, we could sand it all down and make a show prop to kill for with, round off all the edges and everything. But anyway, I'm going to set these props up now. The next thing is to set these up. So the next flying session we have, we can do some testing. What I want to do is get a rough weight of what a 14.5 rev up weighs. And it's about, uh, it's exactly an ounce. It's 28 grams. So with this as my baseline of 28, the smallest of the big props we have is not going to be 28. But surprisingly, I thought it would be a lot more. It's 34, 6 grams more. We certainly, that isn't going to make a big change because we have a lightweight spinner we're working on and a lightweight carbon back plate. But see, as you make the hub thicker, that's where the weight is, down at the hub. And this one is, is 40. So see, you get a significant gain just by the thickness of the hub when you go from a 6 to an 8. But I'm not even going to dream about the 8. I don't even bother setting this up for right now because I don't have the throttle operational yet. But just for, just for my own information, by the way, this is an under-cambered prop. And boy, talk about a razor edge. You flip this by hand. This is, you may as well put your hand in a, in a meat cleaver. This is sharper than an APC. Now, let's just get an idea what the weight is. We're up to 60. See how, when a prop gets bigger, here's what happens. 67. So we go from 28, more than double. And we've only added an inch, of, this is how much we, let's get the hubs lined up. By adding that much out at the tip, of course, which is a significant amount, we've more than doubled the weight of the prop. So for right now, I'm not going to bother with, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with these eight pitches and seven pitches. The problem with all this, the high pitches is I'd really have to throttle back. But the one of these that looks good for right now, now this one is six grams more. So what I'm going to do is an old trick Noel Drindak taught me. We put a bolt through the center of this and then trace out the hub. See how much bigger the hub is? So I can make this the same. We know the 14.5 rev up has the right size hub. And see how much, we, we don't have even too much extra diameter here. It's not a terrible amount. And then what I'll try to do is sand some of the pitch out of the prop. So really what I want to do the first day out, I want to just test this one for now before I spend a whole lot of time setting those up. This is uh, six grams more than this prop. I'll narrow down the hub. And it has this tip. We'll see if this tip shape is going to work for us or if, if it's just nonsense. So a lot of these things are nice sales tools, but about things you didn't expect. 
the three blade is lighter than the two blade <laughs> by a couple of grams too. Wow, it's lighter by a quite a big amount. I really didn't expect this. This three blade is three blade is actually only forty eight grams. It's twice three quarters of an ounce, which is exactly the amount of one more blade. And another thing too that I'm looking at now, they tell you on these instructions that these blades are under pitched. Well, if I measure it, wow, they are really under pitched. I mean, just look at this. This is supposedly a seven pitch. Well, here's an eight pitch. I don't know if you can see this. It's right there. We're lined up. It's quite a bit different. Anyway, this is. I'm going to work with this guy. This is worth a try. I'm. I'm thinking maybe this is going to have some benefit. And it's. It's marked as a 14.7, but it isn't anywhere as near a seven as far as I can. It looks more like a five. Anyway, this. This may have some potential. Now, the only thing is, this is going to add nose weight to the plane. And it may be that it's going to overdo the nose weight element. I don't know. But again, this is why you have to do all the tests. And in uncharted water, you've got to do them over and over again. It's taking the 14.5 rev up. I have a pin through it. It's, it's a, just a quarter inch shaft in essence. What I'm going to do is go over to the belt sander and make this just easier to do with the curve of the belt sander. So I have the same shape that I have on both props. In other words, I'm making the hub thinner and smaller. Just tape the tips together. That just helps hold it while you're over at the belt sander. We have the hubs the same size. Now I want to take the tape off and I want to measure the pitch on this against the 14.5. Since we know the pitch on this is real close, what we're looking for is just more diameter. As an ordinary acetone, I want to take the finisher off the prop because what I want to do is sand out just a little bit of the pitch. It's a little bit, it's pitched just a tad higher than the 14.5 and I'd like to make it equal to the 14.5. Hey, some finishes don't totally come off. You have to do the last little bit soften with acetone. And this looks like Top Flight has a finish that's softened, so we'll just take take this outside and sand it with some 320 paper and then balance the wood. This is how our little toolbox worked out. Seems like we have plenty of room. I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to wind up using this. When I get the battery, it basically stored there. Room for some spare batteries. Nice handle, it came off the suitcase, I put on with D-rings, and for eight dollars I think it was there, uh, we got the little brass corner deal going on there. I think it was uh, a nice little investment and I'm looking forward to using it. Here I am editing footage down. And I'm looking back at my old stuff here, trying to get some footage for the way we were segments. And look what I come across. But I had almost forgotten this. And well, if there ever was a nice version of a Mitchell with a nice paint job. See, now that's what's nice about having a video library. I mean, I, just, I keep going over this and over it. I keep looking at this old footage. Once in a while, I don't. Uh, we get to the end of a tape, and I don't have either room or I haven't gotten enough good footage. 
Because a lot of the stuff, of course, that uh, we shoot is, we've seen these people over and over. I try to find people that we haven't seen in a while. But look at the flaps. Look how, I think this is going to be a great plane. Anyway, David Downey has, um, I think, already started looking at the possibilities. He's given me some numbers and the wing area, different things like that, and he, he's very positive about it. The only thing I think might be a problem is the leadouts might have to come out under the wing to get the vertical CG right. We'll find that out. 25 day, I can't believe it. Every time I look at footage here, I'm trying to shoot other stuff. I turn around as a B-25. It's like they're haunting me already. One of the things I really love is finding a tool that I can use in a shop. And number two, a tool that's not too expensive. Now, here's the way this worked. I've had these solder irons. I don't even have one out here now. These Weller solder irons, and when I do a production run of bell cranks, which is usually a couple of hundred, at the end of it, that solder and iron is, you can't get a decent joint out of it. So Carlos Serra is over here, and he shows me something that I had never seen before. Is it a butane powered solder and iron? Now, and I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, yeah, 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 that's really going to work. Ha, ha, ha. And he shows me, he just turned up the, the, the wick on it, and boy, he was soldering things like I never saw before. So I ran out on the way back from shopping the other day. I passed a Radio Shack. Now, Carlos had one that was about $50. It was a much larger one, but I figured this little one would be good for getting in and doing the connections on the push rods and stuff. It's a Radio Shack item. It's 50 I think it's $14.95 even. And I'll put this on a close-up here. I haven't used it yet, of course, because we're not ready to start running them. I still have a preparation to do. But I'm hoping, boy, if there's anything I would like to have in life, it would be a solder iron that would last through. When you're doing bell cranks, I mean, you, you're working maybe eight, ten hours in a row with a solder iron. If the thing isn't reliable, it stops for Then it gets too hot. Then it, oh, man, is it aggravating. So I'm looking forward to seeing if this is going to be, when we get to that point, if this is going to be one of our choices. This is an excellent little tool for $15. I don't think you can go wrong with it, even if it doesn't work. For $15, it's like, you know, like a pizza. It's not a big deal. And again, I know they make a larger version of this. This is the mini, but I thought, if, what the heck, I'll buy both of them. And I'm sure anytime I can find a new tool that will make my life easier, whatever the cost of the tool is, especially if the tool is cheap, but it's worth every penny of it. In my shop, I've got dozens of tips. I've used these by the dozen. I've, I've been buying them by the case. I've got four or five of these solder irons, and there are even these little, there isn't a one, there isn't a one in this group that'll make it through a production run of bell cranks, let alone, let alone give you dead reliability. So we're, we're very interested, and if anybody's got any con any tips on where to get a, re a solder iron that'll, that'll stand up to a tower work day, love to have it. My birthday's coming up, guys. I had a nice, a nice conversation, oops, there we go, nice conversation with Al Raby today. And Al was uh, giving me some feedback on the B-25 project, upcoming. And I had mentioned to him about Gerald Shamp. I know Gerald is going to be building a Millennium Mustang. And how convenient is it now that we already have a mold for that carbon fiber backplate, should he want one. Anyway, this is some nice photos from Gerald Shamp, and I really appreciate these. By the way, this is a great idea. See the little cork on the end of the... I'll show you another great idea, if I have it here. When I have my router, how many times I've, I've pushed my hand, you can even see where I've pushed it. Always keep a little cork or a little piece of balsa over the end of that. That is, that is definitely a good tip, Jeff. Anyway, he's got his lead-out guide marked. That's a nice idea. Now, what I always do, and it looks like he's already done it, is make an outline of it in 64th plywood and harden it with thin CA, and you get a real nice edge on that. Mike Rogers' pattern master that we just did the clear on really had a beautiful edge there. Mike had really laid that out beautifully. This is Gerald's tip weight box. Now, I'm not sure how Gerald, see, I can't really see here if the bolt goes through here and holds the tip weight, but I would always suggest having a piece of plywood with a bolt to hold the tip weight, and I'll tell you why. 
One of the things I've seen more than one time is a piece of tip weight come loose when you pack this with paper towels or clay or whatever. And what happens when it comes loose, you don't realize it's loose and it's it's shaken in the wing. It eventually eats its way through the tip box and we've had that happen on our own planes. And then it jettisons. And, and if you figure the centrifugal force here, and that piece of lead being a half an ounce or quarter of an ounce, it becomes a bullet. And if you're flying with other people and it goes through their wing or through their, even better, through their face, you could lose a friend. I would always suggest a bolt holding the tip weight. And I don't know if maybe he has a way of doing it that way too, but that is a good way. And that's a nice, see a nice how it follows the contour of the tip. Typical general shamp work. Beautifully done. The wrapped leading edges. A general used a, a Dan Winship horn and a PSP bell crank. Looks like he's got the arrow shaft wrapped on the end. The carbon fiber the same way we do. Nice setup. He said that suits his his reflexes. And the trick is is to find a setup that suits your reflexes. I know Bob Gieske likes real quick controls. People like Paul Walker like them real slow. It depends on your wrist movement. Now, see, this is something that Gerald did. I wish he would have called me when he did this. He laid brass eyelets in because the wire. This is this is you know looking like it's a very thick wing and, and then not enough of the wire was sticking up so we put a brass eyelet there. Well, what I would have easily or gladly done is make him a special one with a three and a half inch wire. I much prefer having the wire than brass, but it's, well, I, you know, it looks like he's already done it. But just so let anybody know, I'm, it's never a problem to make a special belt crank if you're making a real thick wing or, or some setup that you need that's special. And it looks like he's using quite a bit of uh, Wendy's products here, which is good, Joe. Keep buying them. I'll, I'll be able to pay the mortgage this month with the stuff you're buying here. Anyway, Joe, I got a, I got a deal for you. I know you did, there's an envelope over there, a, a tube with your name on it, and I think there's B25 plans in it. But well, let me tell you, whenever you had need something special, please give me a call in the future. Open up the plan from Gerald, and it's a. I guess a, I don't know if this would really qualify as a, uh, a scale. Yeah, it is a scale model. But anyway, beside the point, it's a B25. And one of the things that will be helpful to have is some reference. See, what I'm looking for is, and, and I know I don't need to help Dave Downey figure this out. He'll figure it out on his own. But the feedback of, for instance, this is our, this is our question. Of course, this will be a, a different airfoil. But even if we had the, the wing at this position, it's the vertical CG, and I was hoping we can figure a way to fudge it. Then I did speak to Al about it, and he thought for sure the leadouts were going to have to come out just under the wing. Well, I don't know if they are. But what I could do for sure is put leadouts in the wing, of course. And if the plane, for some reason, was uh, untrimmable at that place, I could make allowances because it'll be a carbon fiber fuselage, I can easily cut. And in fact, I could easily move the, I'm trying to figure out how I could do that. I thought it was gonna be easy. I was gonna think of even putting two belt cranks in, have them separated, and then I could just hook the lead. I could actually run the flying wires through the guide, through the nacelles and into the belt crank. Anyway, we'll figure that out. That's, that's gonna be figured out. Anyway, Jerry, we appreciate this. This is a Nixaroli plan. And believe me, I think, it's my opinion, of course, I think the B-25 is, is going to make an excellent scale project. Now, I've had a couple people that say, oh, no, no, it's, yeah, it's going to be too heavy or too complex or too something. Too hard to deal with. Well, you know what? Everything's too hard to deal with. It's going to be a challenge, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And... Uh, if it doesn't work out, the Spitfire bedroom will have a Mitchell bomber. <laughs> By the way, there are British versions of this plane. When Mike Rogers picked up his plane, he saw those plans that uh, Dave Downey drew of the Mustang, the Reno Air Race with dihedral. <laughs> he took them home. I have a feeling he's going to want to build one. Uh, he's going to be calling Joe Adamusco and maybe Gerald Champ. Anyway, that is a that is a an absolute jewel set of plans. And I hope Mike builds it. He was very excited about building something very semi-scale. 
Uh, he looked at that wing and he saw the F well, and I know he, I think he's hooked. Anyway, we'll see how his plane buffs out. He should have it ready to fly in a week or so. This is B-25s everywhere. Oh, there's one in the background there. I just can't believe it. I'm getting B-25'd here. Anyway, I'm going to run up the flying field. I want to test some of those props. Looks like we have a flyable day. And I'll be dreaming about this B-25. So what I want to do is go through the temperature range from where it's about 70 in the morning to where it's 90 in the afternoon. So what I really want to do, a couple of things. I have that 14, the 15 5, and I want to give that a couple of test flights. I also made up some, some Zinger 14 5s, which are still available from Brodeck. You don't even have to grovel around to find them. So to get a couple of, like I always do, a couple of decent flights or whatever, what I want to do is, of course, first thing, establish my square one flight. Get a flight exactly how it was last time we flew the plane. Make sure the needle hasn't changed, and the needle has been pretty rock steady. And if we have some extra time, I brought back one of the 72 mufflers. I just like to fly with the 72 muffler and the 91 muffler back and back. 72 mufflers a few grams lighter. I think that'll give me enough testing to do for one day. You know, we need to get back and... As usual, on a hot day like this, uh, get our yard work done, get everything ready. we got a big contest weekend coming up. Really proving to be significant is just how, how liberal this engine is, is. You can be off on a needle setting by six, seven clicks, still get through a stunt pattern. And how, I guess consistent is the right word. It just does exactly the same thing. Even when you make changes. Now in the past, when I've had other engines, and you change the prop, you basically were looking at about two weeks of test flying to get, that, to get a reasonable setup back. What I found with this is, I change things, it goes in a click, it goes out a click, and if you don't put it in a click, not much change. It's very, very forgiving. This is probably the easiest of all the big motors that I've fooled around with. But it's like all the Sados, they seem to be relatively stable. They're not real high performance engines. They're not real powerhouses. They just have that nice, I guess, friendly use. Use it back to a little bit. Now, what I, the reason I want to try this first is I want to try that. I'll get always a square one flight. Because what I want to try that I have the 15.5, that's a 15.6, I'm sorry. And what I suspect is, if it may either be too big of a prop, too small, I'll lose the corner, it'll accelerate too hard, or it won't break coming down. We don't know until I try it. The only way to do this is to try it. I've also been pleasantly surprised with one thing. I was really, in the beginning, real skeptical about how this was going to be as far as starts would go. This has just been, I don't think it gets any friendlier than this. So for whatever that's worth to the average person that's just wanting to sport fly or just have a good time, we haven't even had the Z-Tron running yet. That's just going to add a load dimension to it. And that's coming soon.
what I do is I look at the tape right at the field and I try to figure out where I'm overturning it, where I'm underturning it, where it might need a little more or less. And this is, for me anyway, this is a back and forth thing. It's quite labor intensive. Now what I do is I mark where it used to be. In this case, I'm going in. So what I'll do is I'll mark the new spot with a big line. Now I know the old spot, the new spot. And it's a question of trying to find it, of course. And if you don't mark it, of course, here, the drawer just happens. You don't see the, uh... okay, so there's the old spot, the new spot. Now, if I'm not happy, I'll take three or four flights. Go right back. Very, the 15.5, the 15.6, too much pitch. Really didn't even get a decent flight with that. We need to either depitch it, but it looks like the people at APC Prop are going to be making me a special prop, and we'll be testing that with a four inches of pitch. A 15 inch four pitch APC, there's no such thing yet. Lyle Larson and Fred are going to try to work on that. Now see, once the cable gets this short, I'll get one more cut out of it, and then I'll just replace the cable. And one thing, whenever you crimp a cable, what I would do if I was going to fly a plane, you know, for an extended amount of time, at some point in time, and I would say it's safe to say at the beginning of every season, would be a good point to put a new cable in all your handles. Cheap insurance. Well, I have a, a special crimping tool that I really have to be careful. I have a little bit sticking out here. It's a little tricky getting this. Everything is tricky. <coughs> and of course what I'll do is before I put the put the thing back together, get an Allen wrench. Pull on it. Now this is the last time I'll get to I have the always have the old setting in a small mark, new setting in a big mark. Now this is a trick that's worth its weight in gold too. Is to take a pen, because we're going to re-establish neutral, put a little mark on here, because after one flight, I'll want to know. And what happens if you if you loosen the screen, you're sliding and all of a sudden not, you, you just basically hit the reset button. So what this allows me to do is I know what the old setting is, I know what a new setting is, assuming I have to change it. Now before I do the test with the zinger, the zinger is a 14.5, so the, the settings should probably stay roughly the same. I don't have one painted yet, but if they uh, if they show promise, I'll take two or three of them. And of course, you can buy them right from John Brodak. That's the nice thing. You don't have to hunt them down on the internet or anything like you do with the rev-ups. But it seems like even after all this time and after going back and forth with a lot of propellers and fooling around, that 14.5 rev-up shows the most promise of all. And then we'll end the day with our... Just take this muffler off, put the muffler from the 72 on, see if we get better mileage, worse mileage, more power, quieter, whatever the diff. This, this one is a little heavier than the other one. And I hope that'll round out what amounts to be a pretty good test day, even though the air, if, if you saw there's one flight on this tape, I think it's the first one where it went through on the round loops and came in sideways at me, and if you play that in slow motion, <laughs> you'll have a, a real laugh. One of the things that's nice about the plane
run out of alcohol. By the way, neat little tip. The top from one of those water jugs for the alcohol bottle. I know you're all impressed.
cops that I've been spending all the time with. In the last test of the day, I have a zinger that I've, this 14.5 zinger that I've taken some of the pitch out of. Narrowed the hub and put the pins in for Zambelli's pinning. We, all of our props have a, a pin, they key onto the crankshaft. The things in the last half an hour or so, the air has gone all squirrely. I don't know if you can pick some of that up on the video. But when, when the, I, what I like to do is when the air is relatively stable in the morning and it hasn't been good today, today has not been the best day. The air is moving and shifting and I can't keep up with it where it is. It's, it's impossible to locate the camera because halfway through every flight it moves. But, like these geese. Earlier today I was doing something and the geese just flew right across the zone. You like geese, move to Jersey. Canada geese. Those ten cops are going to come and take all this Canada geese back to Canada. Anyway, when you get to this part of the, the day, when the air is... Basically what I can't do is do, you know, a low wing over pullouts or whatever because the air beats are just falling. And by the way, the 91 is the only four-stroke I know of that doesn't have a double nut front end. I, I don't know why that is. It'll be real, it'll be very interesting. Now see what I have. I have the needle set exactly to the, the rev up, and I'm hoping, again, because the rev ups are so hard to get, you just can't buy it. And I should have, my lightweight spinner back plate, the couple that I made out of the mold soon. And that, of course, is going to be a real cost factor. Because this spinner that's on here now, this is our test spinner, is relatively heavy. And not only heavy, it's a nuisance getting on the really In fact, it doesn't fit on the zinger. How convenient. We'll take a flight with no spinner. I need to go home and make the light spinner anyway. I don't want to waste a half an hour at the field cutting and carving. And usually you can just take a little bit off the wood blades and a prop and it'll do the same thing, but I don't want to even bother with that. All I want is a test flight. And again, keep in mind, we're not, we're not at the point in trimming the plane where we're looking for low wing over pullouts or intersections or anything. What I'm looking for is things that are wrong with the trim in a plane that'll that'll allow me to make the plane better in trim. I'm trying to move the in fact I feel the wind now going exactly the opposite of the flight before. But this will give me some idea. The 14.5 has relatively good wind-up control. But the fact that you can buy the zingers in quantity, what makes it nice is you can go home and cut them all up and thin them and change the airflow on them. And and again, Lyle Larson is working with the people at APC Props to have, hopefully, uh, I don't know how long their cycle of development takes, but a prop to test, a 15-inch 4. And we have some, I'll put the address up on the thing. We have a guy in England that hand makes props, EAT Props. Elliot turned me on, I think. And it looks like he's got some low-pitch props. I don't know how long it's going to take to get them from England. We're going to find out real soon. Anyway, development takes time. But this heat and the swirly air are really putting this to a good test. I hear them, I don't see them. Another thing this flight with no spinner will do will give me an idea if the plane would respond to a more rearward CG favorably. No spinner, I don't have the cone. Ah. I came away from this test session really feeling real good about the 14.5 Zingers. What I'm going to do is order up some more of them from Brodak. Make a few with a little less pitch, a few with a little more pitch. That, in fact, when the wind was really buffety, I think the Zinger was just a little bit better than the river, but time will tell. But it's just no substitute for being able to come home, look at the video, 
and see if we've got uh, data information we can use. It's a real squirrely day. And it's always good to get home down in a nice air-conditioned cellar. Now, one of the pleasant surprises of this test day, and believe me, it was a long, hot test day, we're seeing that because this makes available to everybody, and that's one of our criteria, always. And again, John Brodeck has these props. They're not hard to find, and that is a significant gain over the rev-ups. Even though we have a bunch of rev-ups, we're someday going to chip them and nick them and whatever, and they'll be gone. And unless you can find a, an endless supply of stuff, it's kind of uh, pointless. You're, working, you're, you're walking down a dead-end street. Anyway, we're going to pull these apart. I'm going to get a couple of them painted up before the day is over. A very, very good test day. And I hope you're enjoying seeing some of the little bit of what goes on when you have a new plane trimming it out. Again, what I did, I went back and forth with the, the 91 muffler. And this muffler, I tried angling it down, angling it up. Angling it down a little is nice, keeps virtually all of the oil off the plane. There's only a little puddle under there. The 91 muffler is a little shorter and heavier. Sound, pretty much the same. This is just a tad lighter. Now one of the things, because we flew this at the end of the test session without a spinner, and it really responded to having a little bit of that nose weight gone, I am going to make a conscious effort at, in the next week or so, getting all my, I made some carbon fiber backlights. I have not had time to fit them all up and get a spinner cut for this prop. But what I'm trying to do is settle in on which prop is going to be one of the, the choices here. And then I'll have the spinner cut for that prop. We've, the times we spent with four blades and three blades were nowhere as near as good. I think the, the big gain was in having, first off with the four strokes, they seem to respond to big wood props. They don't seem happy with carbon fiber for, for whatever reason, unless I just haven't hit on the right pitch yet. But again, we have Lyle Larson, who's good friends with the person who owns APC and he's been hopefully <laughs> going to get the the person to make a dedicated prop for us which then of course we can pass on to the other people that want to try a 72 or a 91 Sato. Well this is the first contest of the 2001 flying season. And it's, it's a really windy day. And uh, this is only a profile meet, but it kicks off our contest season. And the first plane we see is Rudy Rybeck's Brodak Cardinal. And it's an old profile meet. What do you have to say for yourself? Not a whole What's going on out there? I heard you're working on a secret project. Yeah. Where is it? Got pictures? No, not yet. Still picking out uh, pieces here. How about Dwayne? You think he's ever going to pay me that money he owes me? No, yeah, I just told Rudy. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about being on Karen's shit list. She said I should come down here and, and have Tony Soprano talk to you. <laughs> One Jew takes care of another Jew. Though. That's why I got such a long life. This is fun. We get to break in a new toolbox. Actually, we're not going to stay long. We're just going to say hello to everybody. Buy some donuts or something to uh, support the club. Because we're in the middle of our gardening and landscaping part of the year. So for a day that the wind is really howling, too, they got a pretty good turnout here. I'm really impressed. That's an all profile meet. Actually, it's a good way to kick off the flying season. we got three circles going. I'm trying to pan the area so you can see. And this is the field that Rich Jacobone and Rich Peabody basically have gotten the county to provide for us. And it is a great place. We have used it to work with the typhoon quite a while now, about a, about a month already. <laughs> that you carry they turn the engine the opposite in the opposite direction notice it's a reverse pitch prop well, it 
Maybe they should convert to Z-Tron here. Look at all the stuff you have to have just... I got, I got three fuels of my M01. My M01. This is Brian Silversmith, and what I wanted to, well, the reason I'm doing this, I want to show Sergio, I want to give the copy of this video to Sergio, to see if, if there's any chance they could use a Z-Tron in this event. I just think, I don't know what the rules are even, but how cumbersome it is to have that third line. See where the lines come out in the back of the wing, they slide them and everything, and they have to have three wires. And it can't add to the top speed of the plane having that third wire, that's for sure. I'm always trying to look for different ways you can use that Z-Tron. And I don't know, you know, all these events have different rules, but it certainly would eliminate one of the wires. stay long and you can see the wind is getting worse by the minute. It's our planting day. The Indian Karen's great flower planting day coming up today. Well, it's good to see that they did have another good turnout today. But we're only going to stay about a half an hour, an hour, and then we're on our way out. Kind of a unique looking guy here. I love it. Now we're just going to stay around and see Brian. Brian's got his, uh, the plane we had on last year's video. It's a modified Cardinal. He's going to show it to us at the end of this flight, but it's really so windy. It's, oh yeah. I'm wondering if we shouldn't be leaving and go plant some tomatoes or something. But he's got the plane here, so we'll stick around and get a little look at it. And then that'll be it for today. Moment of truth has arrived. Oh my god, this thing is cool. Ryan, you outdone yourself. Oh, it looks great. Now, how did, how, this is the one we saw in the fall. And it's a cardinal foam wing. Johnny Duncan cut that wing? Who cut the wing? Duncan? Johnny Duncan, yeah. All right. Come on, you tell me that isn't cool. How much does it weigh? Did you weigh it? I don't weigh it. There's no paint on it other than the white and the black. The just... Flip it over so I can see the mud. Sado? You got the 56 in it? At what prop? One of the AHMs or top five? 13.5? 56 Sado. Oh, that's great. Carbon gear. It's fairly light. Well, yeah. that wing will carry 70 ounces. You don't have to work with that bed. I don't think it's 70 ounces. That looks great. It's only got the red paper with the red dye. Now what happens? You can take the pilot out with and get in at the control. And you can, that little link that, that, did you ever have to use it yet? Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's cool as can be. See how he's done the lead outs. 
The Mike Kajeski lead out guy. How's that Sato run? Good? You, you, you've been having good luck with the Sato or not? Talking to me? Yeah. What are you talking about? You! Have Does he have a Sato? He can't afford a Sato. He can't have a Sato with my ringmaster and it runs like, like, a, like, a, like a ring. Where is it? Which one has a Sato? Let me see. We're going to have a Sato club here. The guy with the most expensive Sato gets Mike. to buy Brian lunch. No, Brian. Oh, Brian, no. Yeah, this yeah. is the one that I broke, I broke the prop over my This is, yeah. <laughs> This is the man. He starts him. Pulling that bench around out of here. We <laughs> yeah, I know. We were breaking him in in the fall. <laughs> so this, 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 technically, this is real fancy, Wendy. Let me see this. This I looks just, like a Zambelli high tech. I just tech. bent it so it stays there. Oh, that's high tech. Perfect. High tech. This is a 30? 30. Now, this is what I want to put in my B25. This How did these run? Nice. Excellent. Excellent. Fabulous. Wow. Starts right up. Starts right up. Oh. First group. Ken Very Clapton smooth. has two of these in his pond racer. He said they're beautiful. Very smooth. Yeah, smooth. It what size prop this one? 6 10 five. And it pulls a ringmaster, so two of these got to pull a B25. This pulls a ringmaster like, like a stunt ship. Oh, man, that's nice. That feels like that feels like it's got a lot of... That's got more compression than that, than that, that 72 that I have. I'm using uh, 29% oil. Oh, well, using a lot of oil. Okay. That's why it's got a good compression seal. Well, everybody says just use 50-50, uh, yeah. but I have the 50% oh. cast oil, 29% fuel. If it's fuel. running good, the worst that can happen, if you have a, if too much oil in a fuel, the exhaust valve will stick, and someday it'll have no compression, take the exhaust valve, he already did it, take the exhaust valve out and just decarbonize the stem with a little piece of that 3M paper, and put it right, it, you can do it right at the field, you don't even, yeah. and, but you'll know, it'll have no compression, that the exhaust valve is stuck open. You guys in the in, in stunt moves. Look at his muffler. <laughs> you guys in stunt moves with look at his muffler. It's the size of my thumbnail. They were all talking about Sados, and I uh, decided I put the motor on the plane. I guessed that the tank, and it's yep. a perfect combination. You know what? Since I've been selling Sados, I have never gotten one back. I got a perfect record, so somebody's gonna send one back. Again. They'll stick an exhaust valve. I never got one back. Zambelli's the only one whacked one, so we got to see what they look like inside. We never even had them apart. And it's There's cool. nothing to do to them. It doesn't vibrate. No! no like the it fox, is. the fox will have this no. Oh, the fox will shake the nose off no, of it. And Banjok's been, his is perfect. Well, I saw him fly his, that's why I put him in. Yeah, I like this. Fantastic. That's what I'm flying today. So. Good. Well, I hope you win. <laughs> Yeah, you dropped a big brand. As long as I don't crash. Nah. We don't crash. Neil, have a, have a little confidence in me. This is awesome, though. I think this is great. Actually, you running pressure on it? Well, I've been running all the Sados on pressure. Are you going to fly it, Brian, or not? planning on it unless everything calms down. Well, you're welcome to fly. Right, you can handle it. I want to see Kajeski fly it. Kajeski's the master of four strokes. Did one of you guys in Carrier going to invent the Z-Tron so you can get rid of Is it legal to have a Z-Tron in Carrier? Z-Tron. No, no, no. You wouldn't need three lines. A plane would go about 80 miles an hour faster. Really? Oh, yeah. I got, we got to upgrade you guys in Carrier here. We'll have to have a tune pipe also. I think no, no. Tune pipe. Just, just Z-Tron. Every time I see all these wires, look at them. They have an Asian blind. That's, that's a